uh, most guys that make cues, they used to play a lot of pool. And when I was younger, I used to play a lot of pool. And and uh, I was never, I played a lot of pool, but I was never a player. But I, I could hold my own. And uh, I was in the bar playing against this guy one night. And, and he was kind of a hustler. He liked to hustle into it, but he could never beat me. And, uh, and we played about three, four games. And and uh, he didn't win. And he came up to me and he says, uh, hey, Dave, he says, uh, you see that old guy over there? He says, uh, he wants to bet me $50 that I can't beat you. He says, how would you like to make a fast $25? He says, uh, we'll play. He says, you can you can beat, uh, I'll beat you. He says, we'll get the $50 and we'll split it. And I says, well, that's fine. I says, uh, but do you have $50 on you? And he says, well, do I have $50 on me? Why? I said, well, if you got $50 on you, I says, you might as well give it to me. I says, because that guy over there is my dad. <laughs> he, he felt a little small, but he, he never made the bet. <laughs> like I said, I, I, I used to play a lot of pool. And uh, the town that I lived in, there was only uh, uh, one fellow that, that actually fixed the tips for the guys that played. And the guy that I played a lot of pool with, Rich Pawlowski, he was kind of my mentor. And... Uh, but the fellow that uh, did the queue repairs and stuff, his name was Big Ears. He owned a tavern and he, and he put tips on for the guys. And uh, well, when he passed away, his wife called me and says, hey Dave, uh, you know, Big Ears did all the tips for the guys in town. He says, there's nobody, she said, there's nobody left to do it. Uh, would you be interested in doing it? She says, if you are, she says, you can have his equipment and whatever and, and uh, do it. And I thought, well, what the heck, there's nobody to do it. I'd like to try it. So I went up and, uh, her equipment in, included a tube of glue, a rubber band, and a box of tips. That was the equipment. and uh, But that's how I got started. I started putting the tips on for the guys that I uh, shot pool with. And from there, it just went from one thing to another and evolved into where I am today, I guess. And uh, But then along the way, uh, and I have to give a lot of credit to my son and my wife. I mean, without my wife, I mean, you, her support, you'd never be able to do it. And. Uh, but uh, my son is actually uh, right now. He runs the shop and does everything, and so it's been a great, great adventure for me, I guess. And I've, I've really enjoyed it. So the first showing that they ever had for the for the Cue Makers Association was at the trade show, and each member could put one cue in there, but it had to be a cue that you made yourself. I mean, you, you can't do any of this other stuff. So I had made a lot of cues, but with Dan's help with the parts and all that, so I had made some. But I had one cue, it was solid coca bolo, and I had cut it from the square, I did everything myself. So that's the cue that I put in there. And here we have all of these, Bert Schrager, Leonard Bloodworth, Thomas Wayne, all these beautiful cues, you know, just fabulous. And there I sat with just a plain old Coca Bolo playing Jane Q, and it's like, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what did I do, you know? And uh, but then I thought, hey, I'm proud of it. I made it all myself, and that's what they want, and that's what I did. And lo and behold, I did sell that Q before the show was over. And uh, but after standing there looking at that, that's when I really made up my mind. It's either I'm going to be a Q maker, or I'm going to, or I'm going to find another profession. <laughs> and uh, and it turned out from going from uh, from the lowest man on the totem pole to <coughs> I'm the president of the association, and, and we have our standards and we hold to them, and it's all part of it, you know. And I, I guess one of the most memorable cues in, in, that I've made through the years, uh, uh, we made a cue, a Vietnam cue for our cue collector down in Chicago, Keith Walton, and uh, he commissioned us to, to do it, and, and we made a and that cue was featured in the uh, Billiards Digest. They had a section on there. And uh, shortly after that, the fellow called me up and introduced himself. And uh, he says, I seen that Vietnam cue. He says, I'm a veteran. He says, I'd like to have a Vietnam cue. He says, I'd like to, like to play with a Vietnam cue. And uh, I says, well, I can make one, but I can't duplicate the one that I made because that's a one of a kind. I says, I would have to redesign and do something different. And he said, that's fine. So I worked with them and, and we went back and forth and, and we designed the queue. And then when we had it all designed, uh, he says, well, how long will it take you to make the queue? And I says, well, right now we're running 16 to 20 weeks for four to five months. And he says, is there any way possible to have that done before that? And I says, well, why, you know? And he says, well, he says, I've been, 
diagnosed with terminal cancer, he says, I don't have that long to live. He says, and before I pass, he says, I would love to play with the Vietnam Q. And uh, so we put a special rush on there. And in the meantime, I had, uh, his buddy would call me once in a while and say, hey, and the, the fellow's name was Fred and, and Fred Silkey. And he says, hey, Fred is kind of feeling down in the dumps. And I'd call him up and Fred and I would sit there and we'd BS about old Vietnam stories and talk and stuff, you know. And, and uh, finally, when we got the queue done, we sent it to him. And uh, sadly, shortly after he got the queue, he passed away. And, uh, and after he passed away, his buddy called and let me know. And he said one of his great thrills was when he got that cue. And he said Fred actually sat down and cried. He was so, so excited about getting that cue and that he got to play with that cue before he passed away. So that's actually my most memorable. And I'll never forget that one.